What's up everyone? I'm back on the property. I'm still waiting on my fence parts, so I'm not able to start on my fence yet, but this week I am focusing on getting some trees planted. I brought a bunch of trees up with me a couple days ago. Today I'm also driving up north and picking up some cherry trees. And yeah, that's the agenda for this week. Uh, I explained in my last video that for zoning reasons uh, I really need to start growing something of some kind before I can get accessory structures permitted and my shipping container falls into that category. And also one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my home gardening career is get your perennials planted out early and first. It, you can get, when it comes to annual vegetables, you can take any soil and transform it into a good soil and get vegetables growing in a year or less. But trees and perennials take a long time to establish. I learned that the hard way. I probably had a home garden for five or six years before I actually planted any perennials. And then when I got around to it, you know, I realized, wow, it's going to be three to five years before these are really well established and producing for me. So when it comes to starting this farm from scratch, I know from experience now that uh, I want to get all of my trees planted or almost all of them. So my goal here is it's November right now. I want to have almost all of my fruit trees and my perennials planted that I plan on having for this farm by mid-spring next year. So uh, based on my calculations, that's gonna be about uh, 100 fruit trees. Uh, I have, I don't know, a couple dozen here. Some of them are gonna be my uh, nitrogen-fixing pioneer permaculture uh, style trees that I'm going to be uh, interspersing throughout the tree rows, but uh, most of them are going to be fruit trees of some kind. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go pick up my cherry trees, and then I will uh, continue staking out and uh, digging my holes and getting some stuff in the ground. Okay, so yesterday I went and picked up some cherries and an apricot to add to my fleet that I'm going to be transplanting this week. Uh, yesterday I spent a while preparing some of the planting holes uh, for this tree row. So you can see this is going to be a row of eight trees right here. Everything is going to be 15 foot spacing, so the width of the rows are going to be 15 feet and the spacing in rows 15 feet. I know some trees are going to be on the bigger side, some on the smaller side, but that was kind of the average that I came upon as something I can probably keep everything pruned up to and will be uh, just good standard spacing. I've been using the Meadow Creature Broad Fork to prepare my holes. I discovered it is a lot easier to loosen up a hole with this thing than 
just by shoveling a hole. <clears throat> it also allows me to loosen a larger area than I actually need just for the, uh, everything I have is in number fives or smaller containers. Um, uh, yeah, it allows me to loosen a larger area. So once everything, once the tree is planted, it will have a little bit of a uncompacted zone to begin to root into. And yeah, it's just much easier and takes much less energy to loosen a hole with the broad fork. It still takes some time. It's probably uh, five to eight minutes per hole here. Uh, there is a very uh, hard uh, compaction layer in this soil a few inches down. In the uh, video clips here, you'll see I'm barely able to get the broad fork in even an inch or two in a few spots. Um, but it's pretty easy to just hit the broad fork in a little bit and then you just stand on it and you wiggle it and get it to work its way in and then pull it back and you can loosen your hole. Uh, then I raked out these little dishes and I filled them up with water and they're just soaking still and in a few days uh, I will plant them out. So. Uh, what I'm doing this morning is I'm continuing to stake out some of my tree rows that uh, have not been staked yet. So, like I said in a previous video, this is going to be a tree row here. This is 15 feet from that post to that post there. And I got another one of these 300 foot tape measures. Uh, so this is going to be a field block here. Like I said previously, I have planned to have 36 inch outer pathways, both on the ends and on the sides for wheelbarrows and larger uh, carts and tools. Uh, in between my 30 inch market beds are gonna be 18 inch pathways. So this right here, this side of the tape will be 36 inch pathway. And then one of my field blocks will be right here and they're going to be 100 feet long and up here i am about to stake out one of the corners so i've already staked out this side right here and this also will be a 36 inch pathway and another one of the field blocks over there. This is going to be one of the tree rows right here. And what I've been doing for this entire process is I start back at one of my survey uh, markers on my uh, property boundary corners because I know those are uh, accurately placed. And I've just been pulling kind of square measurements so I, I can spot my fence line from my front corner marker to my back corner marker and then I will measure out a certain distance and same thing over here I have another corner over here and I will pull two measurements off of that and then uh, I will square it up here and where the lines intersect here being a 15 foot wide um, tree row and 121 is my 15 foot tree row going that way at that end 100 foot bed plus three feet and three feet for my end pathways so yeah i'm going to get a stake in there and i'm going to continue along here there's uh, going to be another two tree rows coming this way over there and once those are staked out then i will uh, string down the center of them and measure my 15 foot in uh, in row spacing between trees and I will do the same thing that I did on the end row there um, I will broad fork the hole rake it out a little bit dish it fill it up with water start it soaking and yeah that's pretty much all I'm gonna be doing today
Okay, today is tree planting day. Uh, over the past two days I have been staking and measuring where the rows are going to go. Uh, it's been a little bit more time consuming than I had thought. I have needed to completely clear a brush line to be able to lay my tape measure flat on the ground because the wind combined with just how it lays over the sagebrush if it's you know up off the ground just doesn't give me a really accurate measurement uh, so here's one of the rows right here so this is a 185 foot row and uh, so I will so these are my corner markers for the row and then I stake a center I pull the center line down the row width is 15 feet my in row spacing is 15 feet I went through and I would stake them out and then I bring the broad fork in and loosen up the uh, uh, hole and then I would rake kind of a dirt dish here I fill it up with water and they're uh, They've been sitting for a day now, they're nice and soft. And then I go back through, pull the tape measure through again, stake the centers, and now I'm ready to bring the shovel in and uh, make my holes. So this is one row right here. I probably bit off a little bit more than I could chew as far as getting all these trees planted so just like last time some of them are probably going to come home with me but I have 26 uh, holes marked um, and a couple of them have some big rocks in them that I think I'm just going to leave for another time but the rest of them I think I can get planted out so I'm hoping I can get 24 or so trees in the ground uh, so yeah here's the tape measure pulled um, what I've done here on both of the rows is since I have a row going this way and then I'm and then a field block here and then I'm ultimately gonna have another row going this way separating the two field blocks I have fudged that 15 foot in row spacing number a little bit to get my uh, intersecting rows to line up. So for instance on this one, and it has worked out pretty close, uh, surprisingly close in fact. So on this long row up here, at the end of where the field block is going to be, I wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be a tree in the way of my pathway um, to, to exit the row and come back here which were where ultimately like post harvest stuff is going to happen and so on this row it actually uh, ended up being 15.1 uh, feet between all the trees you know over the course of 11 trees that gave me an extra foot of spacing and that gave me the nice gap there at the end of the field block to walk between the trees and then here where the tree rows are actually going to intersect it ended up being 15 and a quarter feet in row spacing and that got me a tree placed right here to intersect the middle of this row so the middle of this row is this stake right here there's that. I'm going to stake that out here in a couple minutes. And then that also got me my tree at the very end, which is where another intersecting row is going to be. Right here. And I did not get around to doing this row. That'll be for another trip. But I did stake out the very end. So this is really where the cultivation is going to end probably going to be a driveway right here and a house will go back over here but everything on this side is just going to remain bare desert this is where the action is all going to happen back here so yeah I'm really stoked uh, I'm going to try to get as many trees in the ground in the next couple hours as I can before I need to head home let's do this 
Okay, first planting today is going to be one of these mesquite trees that I started from some eBay seeds. Uh, like I said previously, I am going to be trying to utilize some uh, pioneer species trees. At least that's what you'd call them in permaculture. Uh, just nitrogen fixing, uh, very hardy, fast growing trees. Um, theoretically to feed the soil uh, around it, potentially providing nitrogen to the surrounding trees, but also just something that will establish quickly, become a windbreak quickly. The mesquites uh, and the mimosas put out uh, very large uh, flowers that attract pollinators. Uh, I like the look of them, the aesthetics is a big thing, and uh, so yeah, I'm going to be interspersing mesquite and mimosa throughout the uh, tree rows along with my fruit trees and other perennials. Uh, this is one of the better looking ones that I started probably almost a year ago now. Uh, so hopefully it's not too root bound in the pot, but uh, yeah, so I have staked the centers. When I pull this out, I'm left with a little marker there. I don't really need that big a hole for this particular tree here. Most of these holes have not been too rocky, so that has been uh, a pleasant surprise. Um, so in my uh, previous video, I explained that I'm going to be using this Myco, Myco Grow Soluble Mycorrhiza Inoculant from Fungi Perfecti, which is Paul Stamets brand. Uh, previously I had dusted on the roots, but this is actually supposed to be mixed in water. So they're calling for an ounce for 12 gallons of water. This is five. This is one ounce. Alright. And then I'm also going to be using this uh, maxi crop seaweed extract. Um, just kind of as a theoretical little uh, fertilizer boost to a, a new planting. Some people say that the seaweed has some uh, plant hormones in it that can stimulate root growth, root development. Um, I'm going to be uh, using this bucket for hopefully all of my plantings. And then this stuff <coughs> is pretty concentrated. They call it a teaspoon for a gallon of water. So I'm going to do a tablespoon or so for this bucket. Uh, I used to work at a farm a few years ago and we uh, used, I believe it, it was a seaweed extract of some kind, but it was, uh, I think it was maxi crop in uh, all of our seedlings, all of our transplants. And that farm uh, had some pretty good looking plants, so I don't know if that was a factor, but uh, probably not going to hurt anything.
Okay, that's kind of the goody bath there. Um, this one is going to get a tree tube because I can uh, fit one over top of it like the pomegranate that I planted last time. So I'm gonna remove the stake. Roots look pretty good, not too root bound. Or really root bound at all that I would say. Maybe loosen these up just a little bit to let the plant know that it has some room to grow. Gonna try to do a little dunk here. Well, hopefully not having the whole soil ball fall out from under me. And there it is. Fill back in the hole here, toss a tree tube on it, and move on to the next one. Looks pretty good. That was pretty easy, pretty fast. I'll grab the tree tube. So these are the US native mesquite species. There is a thornless Chilean mesquite that is commonly uh, seen at ow, nursery centers. But in my research, the Chilean mesquite is not nearly as cold hardy as the American native varieties. And I could not find any uh, Cal uh, US native mesquites available in uh, as plant starts so I had to do my own seeds and my own starts Stake broke. All right, new stake. All right, there's one, hopefully 24 more. Okay, here's the next one. This is a Montmorency cherry on a semi-dwarf rootstock. Um, one of my plans for all these tree rows, like I said, I had originally planned on doing a typical food forest. Uh, after thinking about it, I decided to go with an alley cropping style system where I basically break up my food forest into rows and put my cultivated field blocks for the vegetables in between the rows. And one thing that I really appreciate about uh, permaculture food forests and I think one thing that most people find the most aesthetically pleasing about permaculture gardens in general is the variation and diversity of different types of plants all intermixed uh, amongst themselves uh, in a very uh, non-standard way compared to a typical like monoculture farm or 
even the way that many orchards are laid out being like one variety per row. Uh, so my goal with all these tree rows is to have total randomness in my placings of different trees. I want it to seem like it's just totally scattershot for like which variety is where. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna have the um, mimosa and mesquite trees plant interplanted amongst the tree rows. And I also just want different fruit varieties and species totally intermixed. Um, any instance in which a uh, tr a tree requires a pollinator. Of course, I'm going to plant it next to a pollinator. If anything is described at least as partly self-fruitful, where in the description it will say, like, will benefit or get a heavier yield by being planted to next to one of its own, uh, of which the ch uh, Montmorency cherry is one of them. I'm going to plant two of them next to each other, so I'm going to go two cherries here next to each other. Uh, but then instead of just, you know, in a typical situation, you might just have a whole row of Montmorency sour cherries. Uh, I'm just going to do two here next to each other to get the pollination benefit. And then I have two more that I'm going to just put somewhere else in the tree rows. And I have not, I'm really just picking these totally at random with a little bit of research about what needs pollinators. Um, but I really want, my goal is to just have the appearance of randomness uh, amongst the tree rows and just have as many different species intermixed as possible. So, all right, stir up the goodies a little bit more here. It just so happens that these kind of standard shovels are almost the exact radius of a number five pot. Uh, and for logistics purposes and the size of my van and everything I've found, the number fives, I'm going to try to get everything in number fives. It's just a great size. They're of decent size. It's not a number one or something like that. And But 15s are just too big for me to really handle. They're a lot more expensive, so I'm going to be going with number fives on everything. One uh, really great permaculture YouTuber was a guy named Stefan Sapoviak, I think his name is. He's up in Canada. He has a really cool permaculture uh, orchard, with almost all fruit trees. And he has this system where he actually interplants a nitrogen fixing tree every other fruit tree. And I really liked that system. Uh, and I thought about it for a while, uh, but given the somewhat confined space I have here and how I'm trying to keep everything very condensed and relatively small, probably only a little over an acre uh, between the trees and the field blocks, um, when I ran the numbers, it was, it would just, you know, it would, if I had a nitrogen fixing tree, every other tree, I'm cutting my potential fruit yield in half with that system. And I don't think it's entirely necessary for fertility reasons. I know that's one of the main reasons he does it. Obviously you can have uh, successful orchards with no uh, nitrogen fixing trees interplanted in them. In fact, that's the standard way of doing it. So. 
Uh, I th I've thought about it and for my context here, I'm probably going to have, I don't know, maybe one out of every eight fruit trees be a nitrogen fixing uh, mimosa or mesquite tree. Um, yeah. Gonna size up the hole here. That looks pretty good. Maybe a little backfill. All right. Time for the dunk. Get that uh, root to mycorrhizal fungi spore contact, which is required to colonize the roots. Alright, that looks pretty good. I'm thinking... I'm thinking I can probably get a tree tube around this one, so I'm going to give that a shot. So like I said before, this is a very temporary... Uh, technique or measure. All right, that looks pretty good. Alright, there's number two for today, 22 more, hopefully. Okay, sour cherry number two.
Okay. There's the dunk. Okay, that looks good. Another tree tube. Okay, so number four today is going to be a jujube. A lot of people out there probably don't know what a jujube is or have never had one. Uh, the farm I used to work at years back uh, grew them. I really like them. Uh, supposedly they are very hardy trees, cold tolerant, heat tolerant, drought tolerant relatively pest free uh, so I decided to add them to the list uh, shout out to Alex at Papaya Tree Nursery in Granada Hills California that's where I got these uh, three UGB trees from supposedly this is a variety that uh, his family was gifted by somebody from China I believe uh, several decades ago and it's a variety that they have uh, continued in cultivation and sold trees for for many years uh, he claimed it was a little better in some regards than some of the other common varieties of jujube uh, he claimed it to be self fruitful um, but in my research with other jujubes uh, the ones that are claimed to be self-fruitful are really partly self-fruitful. So again, I'm going to plant uh, a few of them, uh, or two of them together here for pollination purposes. Uh, these are not gonna get tree tubes, but I'm gonna drive this stake in as far as I can for some wind support.
Okay, that one looks pretty good. That should provide it sufficient wind support, especially with no foliage on it. It's not going to get pushed very hard. Uh, but the winds are definitely fierce here up in the high desert from time to time. All right, so like I said, I'm going to plant uh, another one of these um, jujubes next to it. Uh, but I'm going to do uh, the next one in that row there. But for right now, I'm going to continue on down this row. Next one's going to be an AC Sweet Pomegranate. So I'll, uh, in my next video, I will really go into depth about my variety and species selection strategy on this whole farm as far as my fruit trees and perennials go. Uh, but in short, what I'm trying to do is pick really hardy uh, species for the climate that I'm in here. Uh, like I've said, the high desert has pretty erratic weather patterns and also that combined with overall climate uncertainty about how things are going to be in the future. I am trying to pick varieties and species that are able to withstand a significant uh, swing from the average that I have here. So that's going to be really cold tolerant, well below the average low temperatures that I have here because periodically we do get uh, really hard freezes that are very much out of the norm. We will also get heat uh, waves that are way hotter than the norm. Uh, the high desert is prone for late frosts on occasion, so I'm picking all late blooming uh, varieties of trees so that uh, I don't get the blooms frozen off and lose my fruit for the year. And uh, so case in point with pomegranates, most pomegranates that you will find are listed as being hardy from like zone 7 to 8 uh, and up like seven to nine or so, uh, but there are certain varieties that are listed as exceptionally cold tolerant. The AC Sweet variety is one of them. Uh, people are probably familiar with Dave Wilson uh, Tree Nursery, uh, and they list it as being one of the cold hardiest uh, pomegranate varieties that they sell. And on this plant tag it says, and this is a Dave Wilson tag, it says developed in Salt Lake City, Utah, but on their website it says developed in Arizona, so I'm not sure. But uh, regardless, multiple websites list it as being one of the cold hardiest pomegranates that you can grow. Uh, so I'm going to be choosing AC Sweets and some of the Russian varieties that are listed as being super cold tolerant. So that's just kind of my strategy for making an extra resilient uh, fruit guild. That looks pretty good, huh? Yeah. And dunk. Mycorrhizal spore contact with the roots.
cool. That's uh, four so far. Five this five so far this morning. Making pretty good time. Okay, so the next tree is going to be a Chinese apricot. Like I was just explaining, I want all of my fruit trees to be of the late blooming uh, type so that uh, you can I can avoid uh, the fruit blossoms being frozen off in a late frost scenario which we can get here in the high desert uh, in the spring <clears throat> things can really start warming up and it can kind of trigger things to blossom and then you get one or two days of a really hard freeze Blossoms are killed, trees fine, keeps growing vegetatively, puts on leaves and looks great, but uh, you can lose your whole fruit crop. So to uh, make my uh, fruit trees as resilient and hardy as possible, I'm picking late um, blooming varieties. Uh, on the Dave Wilson uh, nursery website, you can uh, select for late blooming varieties and it will give you a list of all their trees that are of the late blooming variety. Uh, the Chinese apricot I believe was one of them or at least in the description it was and uh, I believe it's listed as self-fruitful or partly self-fruitful uh, but I did read that they can benefit from being planted next to each other so I'm actually going to leave the next uh, spot here open because I don't have another apricot at the moment. I'm going to put that on my list get another apricot, either another one of these Chinese or uh, another late blooming variety and put that one there. Uh, so yeah. Like I said, these standard shovels are just great for digging number five holes. The radius is just perfect. A little deeper. That looks pretty good. And the dunk. So this one is a little too woody to get inside of a tree tube so and I don't think it's really tall enough to have any wind toppling risk so it's just going to be left bare like that hopefully no deer or anything come and chew the bark off or something but I think it'll be all right Cool, so there is two, four, six done, 19 to go.
So like I said, I skipped one because I want to put another apricot next to that Chinese apricot for pollination purposes. This is the end of this row and what will be the end of a row running that way. Uh, I'm really excited about this one. I really love figs. I'm going to plant a lot of figs here. Um, and this particular variety is called Desert King. Uh, Online, it is described as being particularly cold hardy, good in hot inland climates. I have had some Desert King figs and they are exceptionally good eating figs. Really big, sweet, good flavor profile. And uh, I had to search a little far and wide to get some this late in the season. It's kind of an irregular time to be planting fruit trees. Normally it's early spring. Um, but I really want to get all my fruit trees in the ground by the middle of next spring and for zoning purposes I need to get some stuff planted out so that I can get my shipping container and greenhouse and solar permitted. Uh, so this is a Desert King fig. I've got one other one I'm going to be planting today. And yeah, it's a variety I'm really excited about. Uh, as far as figs go, figs are not the most hardy of uh, fruit tree species. Uh, they're usually listed as like a zone seven or eight and above, but there are a couple varieties that are as be, uh, described as being good down to a five or so. Uh, so the four fig varieties that I'm gonna grow here that I kind of homed in on as being good candidates for this climate are Desert King, Peter's Honey, Chicago Hardy, which is pretty much the hardiest fig that I can find, at least by description at least. And uh, Violet is another one, and I have one of those I'm going to plant today. So I need to track down some Chicago Hardies. And uh, some Peter's Honey. Uh, but yeah, so excited about these probably going to have a little higher percentage of figs than uh, some of the other fruit trees because I like them so much and they are relatively drought tolerant and durable trees in general so that looks pretty good I think I'm going to beef this one up with a heartier steak uh, yeah Oh cool, there's some uh, worms in there. Hopefully they will make uh, their home in this soil. I have not seen and don't expect to see earthworms here really. Just doesn't seem like a very conducive environment to them, but hopefully as I get my organic matter built up and fertility and soil life up, I will start to see more earthworms. All right. Number seven this morning, keep it a pretty good pace. Desert King number one, Fig number one, sweet. Okay, I had to charge my camera battery a little bit there while I continued planting. Everything is in the ground that's gonna be in the ground uh, on this trip. I got 19 trees planted. Uh, I watered everything in. I went around and raked the uh, dirt dishes out a little bit more, filled them all up with water. They've all soaked in pretty well now. This is that Violet fig. Here's a jujube. I left a couple spots open because I don't have the entire blend of uh, trees that I'm going to be planting on the farm entirely here on this trip and I want to incorporate some of them in here so like I left this spot open I might put like an apple or a peach or a pear 
there. I left a couple spots open on that uh, side as well. Everything that could fit a tree tube got a tree tube. I put two more of the sour Montmorency cherries down here. AC sweet pomegranate. The uh, two cherries there, the two jujubes, pomegranate. The apricot with a space for another apricot for pollination. That desert king fig. Uh, the two mimosas, put the other desert king fig there. And yeah, everything's looking really good. I'm super excited. I can finally see the framework and the bones of the farm uh, coming into view now. It doesn't look like much right now, but I'm gonna eventually get all this brush cleared out of the 15 foot tree rows and get some wood chips and completely mulch uh, the entire tree rows. That should help uh, improve the soil and water retention and uh, it will look a lot nicer. So yeah, I'm really excited. Thanks for watching. Give me a comment below. Uh, until the next one, peace. <laughs>